So welcome, everybody, to the Martin Siegel Theater Center here at the Schweizer Center of CUNY. My name is Frank Hensch. I'm the director of programs and the director of the Siegel Center. And today is a very uh, special day uh, for us, and I think in the bigger uh, sense also for the world of theater. Tonight we are remembering one of the giants uh, of uh, global theater, world theater, and it is uh, the El Italian um, actor, comedian, uh, a writer, director, um, Dario Fo. And um, turn your microphone. Is it on? Yes. Yes. So again, uh, so welcome to the Martin Siegel Theater Center <laughs> here <laughs> at the Grand Center Cooney. This is for Bob Brustein, who is listening in. So he uh, ha has to hear what I say. Just uh, as I said before, Bob Brustein couldn't join us uh, tonight through to uh, some things that didn't go as we planned. Um, but he is live with us on Skype, and uh, he will uh, uh, talk uh, with us. Again, Bob uh, was the one who brought uh, Dario Fo um, over here um, in a very lengthy process, actually, as we learned uh, from the film. I think it took them two years to get him here. And, uh, and we do uh, come together tonight to celebrate one of our own, our giant in the field of theater, uh, Dario Fo, who was a, uh, uh, truly a role model. He was an activist, an actor, a director. He was a true human being, as we said. And he carried on a thousand-year-old uh, tradition of the storytelling at the Hakavati, as they say in the Arab uh, theater, but uh, something that um, is as ancient as mankind. And most probably when the first people came up to give a funeral to someone, as some said, this is how the culture started. And I'm sure someone afterwards made a little joke and told the story of the person. So this is the very, very... Um, very beginning and foe, as we also learned and heard, he is a bridge between the past um, and the present and his innovations in theater, his reinterpretation of Brecht's uh, idea uh, of political theater, his rediscovery of the world of the commedia and the zani and not in a commercial, cheap uh, 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 um, entertainment sense, but as a true uttering of a human uh, existence is, uh, is unique and uh, Got brought him success all around the world. As we know, he uh, became he got the Nobel Prize. Very few writers ever got uh, the Nobel Prize um, in writing. And it was the O'Neill, or I think uh, uh, Pirandello, and it was the Elfriede Jelinek, and of course, uh, then also uh, Dario Fo. And um, it was the most performed playwright at this time around the globe. And uh, this just gives us an idea um, of his uh, a special uh, uh, way to reach out to audiences, this idea of popular theater and uh, what it should be, and also his connection to spiritual thinking or to what a church should be, a church is a theater. He took us through that tour of a church in the uh, second documentary, the first documentary we saw. Um, I would like to, Nate, also to thank the Italian Cultural Institute uh, for, for supporting us, Fabio, and um, mm -hmm. uh, Giorgio van Straten, and Humanism, Valeria, who supported us here, and um, everybody. Um, who was um, involved. And um, with us tonight, we have Joe Crifazi, a, a real Italian-American actor uh, who actually Four performed, uh, performed uh, 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 Dario Fo on Broadway. We will talk a bit about later. And he prepared for us excerpts um, from um, some of the uh, Fo plays. And, um, and in between, I hope it all works out. Is Skype is uh, the Skype gods are friendly towards us. We will speak with Bob Brusen, who is still in Florida and couldn't uh, couldn't come uh, back uh, in time. So um, maybe we start with the uh, very very uh, first uh, uh, work, and it's a play that's not as well known. It's the Discovery uh, of America, shown uh, pardon, and uh, and uh, it's a play Dario Fo wrote and researched, and uh, this was a. A, a, a piece we thought is a good way to discovery, to discover in the very beginning. So, um, Joe. <coughs> Johann Padan is a character we also find in the Commedia dell'arte, called by other names, Giovanni Gianizzani. This Johann is a kind of Ruzante, more precisely Aizani, the prototype of the mask of Alecchino, who, as we will see, was born in the valleys of Brescia and Bergamo and finds himself literally propelled to the Indies where he's engaged on a ship that is a part of Columbus' fourth expedition. Now, to tell you the truth, I had not thought of writing this text, let alone encountering a character of such complexity, until the summer of 1991 when I was invited to Spain, Seville to be exact, with Franca to make a presentation for a theater full of critics, 
theater writers, actors, and cultural experts about the structure of Isabella, Three Tall Ships, and a Con Man, the play I was supposed to present that spring in 1992 at the exposition in honor of Christopher Columbus. It was a play that I had suggested with Franca about 29 years earlier in 1963 for the opening of the theatrical season at the Odeon in Milan. At its debut and for the duration of the tour, the play aroused scandals, consensus, sensation, and polemics, especially on the part of reactionaries. Today, the behavior of theater audiences has changed a great deal, though. People participate with tranquility, <laughs> with serenity, sitting in their chairs without living the situation. They're listening, their listening is passive, digestive, <laughs> like television. Um, <clears throat> when I returned to Italy, I threw myself into researching texts about the discovery of the Americas, written by protagonists who were almost unknown. That was how I discovered this account, practically a ship's journal of a sailor who had the slightly grotesque name of Cabeza de Vaca. <laughs> Cabeza de Vaca, moo, gabiche. Okay, his peripatetic adventures seemed to be almost exact duplicates of those that I had recounted in Seville. And I found another autobiographical chronicle very similar to that of Cabeza de Vaca, written by Hans Staten, a German sailor who had also found himself in the Indies and lived the life of Robinson Crusoe. He was imprisoned by Indians who fed him, caressed him, fattened him up with the intention of eating him. Researching adventures narrated by sailors of the lower ranks, I also came across Sigala, a Genoan who had sailed with Columbus and arrived in Florida and became the head of a tribe of Machuco Indians. I also met a sailor from Palos, Gonzalo Guerriero, who deserted from the expedition of Tristan de Cabaco and ended up as a prisoner of the Incas, who after condemning him to death, had second thoughts and elected him their sacred wizard. <laughs> and finally, I, I discovered the tales of Michela di Cuneo, who was the right-hand man and confidant of Columbus. This sailor was an unbiased witness uh, to the events that, were, events that were terrifying, especially given the pitiless realism with which they were expressed in these journals. Well, what struck me most about da Cuneo's account uh, was the invention of a language that availed itself of all the idioms of Romance languages, a kind of lexical pastiche used at the time by all the sailors of the Mediterranean, a mixture of numerous languages and dialects, Lombardian, Venetian, Catalanian, Castilian, Provençal, Portuguese, and also a little Arabic, just for the fun of it, and for spice, what are you gonna say? I said to myself, this is my man! I'll call him Johan Fadan, and I'll make him speak this gramolot of the seaports. <laughs> <laughs> well, naturally, the lexically unbiased spectators, gifted with the exceptional imaginations, will have the advantage of understanding the punchlines even before I finish speaking them. <laughs> the rest of you, the normal ones, will laugh later, at the end of the wave. Basta. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um Thank you, um, thank you very much. And then um, I think it, uh, he starts on his uh, voyage from Seville and uh, crosses the ocean and, and comes to America. And uh, it's an interesting, interesting text. But maybe uh, Mike and Brad, let's see if uh, our, um, our um, line to uh, Florida is working. So here he is. Uh, so Bob, thank you so much for joining us. I think he has to press the mute button. We need to hear you. Let's see. Is it on? Um, we still don't hear. We don't have a sound. And this is like on CNN when they say, "How close are you?" And uh, and um, yeah. That's that's good. Thing. Oh, there okay, it is. wonderful. So Bob, we can. Okay, right. So thank you for joining us tonight. It's my great pleasure, and please, my my, my uh, apologies to the audience. I have a flu and I didn't want to contaminate all of you except with laughter tonight. So uh, <laughs> we come out of clear. Wonderful. So, 
Also, may, may I send my salutations to Joe Verfossi, who is probably uh, an actor as close to Poe as there is in the United States, and who I uh, am very uh, gratified to uh, claim as a former student at the Yale School of Drama. And my thanks to Frank for inviting me tonight. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you so much, um, Bob. Um, uh, Bob, uh, you are known uh, not only you know, as the founder of the Yale Repertory Theater, the ART in Boston, but also because of your book, The Theater of Revolt. Um, would, you, would you include Dario Fo as one of the main chapters looking now on his work? Well, absolutely, except uh, uh, that brings up an interesting question. The, the Theater of Revolt makes the position that uh, political revolt, per se, without uh, some uh, uh, quality of, uh, of complication uh, is not for true theater. Uh, and, uh, you know, when Dario went off simply uh, as a polemicist, uh, it was not true theater, but he always did have the alternating capacity to complicate, and uh, he complicated through, through comedy. So I would say he's very much a part of the theater of revolt, yes. Yes, thank you. So how did you discover him first? When did you hear of him? Uh, that's interesting. Uh, I, I think I saw a, a film, if I'm not mistaken, uh, in the 90s that involved him and Franca, and I was so taken with the extraordinary genius, both of them, uh, that I invited them to the United States where they uh, performed at the American Repertory Theater in 2001. As a matter of fact, and coincidentally, uh, during, the, during the time of the, uh, the attack on the World Trade Center, uh, so he uh, actually stopped a few performances in deference to that uh, terrible event. Yeah. Thank you. What, what draws you to him? What do you think makes him so uh, unique? Well, uh, he's not unique because he's in a great tradition of uh, the Giuliari, the uh, low clowns, the buffoons of the uh, Italian theater. Uh, I guess you think the closest comedian we have was W.C. Fields. Uh, and, uh, uh, but he's unique in his own persona, uh, that of the, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, of the buffoon, also the wise man. He's as old as Socrates. You know, Socrates once said that the wisest man is the one who knows he's a fool. And that is the, that is the Dario Fo. Yeah. So um, I think you did two or three faux shows, right, in Boston. Which were they? Why did you uh, select them? Uh, well, you partly selected them. We selected them together. One was uh, John Fatua. I forgot the name of it. Johan Fatua. Yeah. Uh, John the Discovery of uh, Americas. Mm -hmm. And the Discovery of America, yes. And the, uh, the other was the show he did with Frank. Uh, we won't pay, we won't pay, as we called it. I see it's now called uh, We Won't Pay, I Won't Pay, I Can't Pay. Huh. But we always call it We Won't Pay, We Won't Pay, which is a more literal translation of his title. Uh, and um, uh, both of them went extremely well. So, um, did he have a presence on campus when he came? Did he interact with uh, students, faculty, people from Cambridge? Or? He, he did give a few uh, uh, question and answer sessions, uh, which we translated. His English was not that strong. Uh, and uh, he was uh, then uh, extremely informative and extremely amusing. Uh, I think when, when Fo, Dario Fo was a young actor, he uh, was at the Piccolo Teatro with Strailer. He actually was, in, if I remember right, in the same cast, as the uh, same group as Marcello Mastroianni, and, uh, oh, and, yeah. and, uh, met, uh, and met Brecht, and, um, who he also quotes and influenced him. Do you, where do you see him in the, uh, in the kind of uh, lineage of Brecht? And what did he change, or what did he make different, and how successful was it? How successful was he? As a Brecht, uh, uh, yeah. Well, you know, he wasn't essentially a literary figure, so I don't think you can put him in the same category as Brecht. You can put him in the same genre, certainly, as a political commentator. 
Oh, uh, but, but he was more a performer than he was a, uh, uh, a, a writer. And, uh, well, he got the Nobel Prize. Yes, he did, but he was certainly one of the first, if not the first, uh, actual performers to get that prize. Um, later, Bob Dylan got it, but uh, I think uh, Dario was the first. Yeah, I I, um, I think that uh, if you look at the accidental death of the of the anarchist, you know, it is very much in that idea of Brecht's um, um, street theater, a street street scene to to you know to show what happened, and um, and I think he went a bit beyond the uh, didactic fables. He really introduced the laughter and the uh, 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 popular theater that um, perhaps Brecht was looking for, but not always was able to to create. Absolutely. I don't think you can say he's greater than Brecht, which I think you're implying. He's just different than Brecht. And uh, uh, both of them are out. I think, uh, Bob, we have a little mic uh, problem. Um, His hand is over the microphone. What? His hand is over the microphone. He's covering his own microphone. Yeah. Can we, uh, Bob, can you hear us? Um, I, I think um, maybe um, we try to, um, uh, try to work that out and, uh, and in good uh, improvisational uh, uh, lineage we go. Perhaps we go to, uh, to the second uh, piece and um, we ask uh, um, um, Joe to... Um, yeah. To, but do I have to perform with Bob staring at me over my shoulder? No, we're going to put it down, and, uh, and say, here we go. Uh, and now we come uh, 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 to a play, as Joe said. Uh, my please, teacher, you know Joe I mean? said, please announce this piece now as this is about lobbyists. <laughs> I don't know what, what to say. Uh, this is from Mistero Buffo, a, a, a segment. <laughs> in Umbria, the term nailer refers to the man who nails Christ to the cross during the performance of the lauds. In the Po Valley, they use the term spiker or crucifer in the passion play performed in the dialect of that region, which we will now present to you. <clears throat> this year in Pisa, you can see an exhibition of the statues from the 12th and 13th centuries depicting the life-size saints, life-size saints reacting around the cross, you know as they would, you know, uh, whatever. Originally, these painted statues were used in the Passion Plays. The crucified Christ was represented with articulated arms and wrists and legs so that the descent from the cross could be done in a way that it made Jesus seem real. Fun, huh? I don't know. I'll be in my dressing room. What can I say? The technique used by the nailers to stretch out and hoist Jesus onto the cross is described with surprising, almost obsessive precision. One gets the impression that in those times the act of nailing people on crosses was very well known and even fashionable. Yes, on the other hand, we know that this horrendous form of execution continued to be practiced until the 8th and 9th centuries. This is the reason why up to that day, in the frescoes and miniatures that depict the life of Christ, the moment of the crucifixion is inexorably censored. One cannot be permitted to get down on one's knees and pray to a man, even if he's divine, condemned to a cross, and then leave the church to find a real one hoisted on a similar crucifix. So, what follows is uh, a piece about the drama under the cross presented by a fool as the absolute protagonist. This text requires the presence of a solo performer acting out all the roles except Christ. The figure of Christ is created with a polychrome wooden statue which has moving parts. It is identical to the one used in the Tuscan and Umbrian mystery plays from the 10th to the 13th centuries, of which several examples are extant. So, Aguilare, the fool, is squatting at a card game. <clears throat> Buffa, king, goblets, oh, woman on a horse, I lose, oh, man, okay. 
again. Here we go. Come on. You, one, two, three, go. Boom. What? The wagon. Two. Good. What? Two brothers. Five of staffs. Aha. The emperor. Nah, I lost again. I'm paying. I'm paying, all right? Here, take your money. Here, I haven't won a thing. Uh, hey, listen, excuse me, okay? Now, stay here. Wait, wait for me. I, I, I'll be right back. Jesus, listen, I'm sorry, but yeah, I know it's not good manners to go around busting the blessed balls of somebody who's already suffering on the cross, <laughs> nailed to it even, but I come to ask you if you could do me a little favor. Jesus, I'm someone who has never won a game, not a single round, because I'm always surrounded by these, these miscreant charlatans who cheat at the game like junk dealers selling gold-covered gold -covered lead they don't play fair with their cards, Jesus, you know? Uh, you know it. You, you see it, right? right? You do see it. But hey, Jesus, I'm here. Where are you looking over there? Huh? Jesus, look. Be good to me, huh? Be kind to me. Give me the wondrous pleasure of letting me win at least once, okay? Come on. Jesus, look. Give me a sign, all right? Yeah, give me, it's a little difficult to do with your hands nailed, but you know, d d d d your eyes, blink your eyes, okay? Good, good. Did you blink? Yes? Huh? Do it again. Huh? You blinked! You blinked! Oh, my dear man, I could come up there and give you a hug. <laughs> You're really going to make me win, right? Right? Huh? Don't joke around with me. Come on, or I'll blaspheme against you. Swear on your father that you told me so. You know, it would be a lousy thing to do, you know, for somebody up on a cross to play a trick on me just before dropping dead. <laughs> it would be a bad joke. All right, I'm going to go play, Jesus. <clears throat> I'm going to go play. Okay, listen up. I'm coming, uh, coming back to the game here. <clears throat> Let's go. Come on. Ready? Mm, 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 mm. You. Okay, boom. Oh, Bufa, soldier with the joke. Oh, horse over the queen. That's mine. Ha, 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 ha. Okay, what do you have? Huh? You got the moon, he's got the sorceress, I got the devil. That's mine. <laughs> oh, Jesus, you got the power. Okay, uh, let's start again. Here we go. Okay. Queen of virgins, king of staffs, with the gold, the earthquake, and the fat head, that's mine. <laughs> uh, you're overdoing it. Take it easy. Oh, five in a row for me, huh? Yeah, that's pretty good. What? What, you're not playing anymore? Come on. You don't have any more money? All right, I, I'll give you some money. Yeah, yeah, I got some silver, you know? Yeah, take it, take it, take it, silver. No, I didn't steal it. They were Judas's, and he threw them at the thorns. Yeah, I got scratched all over picking them up. Here, take it. You can have them since Judas hung himself over there, you know? Come on. Of course I want something from you in exchange. What, I think I'm crazy? Yeah, let's make a deal. You, you give him to me, okay? Yeah, the permission to take him down and carry him away with me. Yes, Jesus Christ, for me, okay? No, not dead. No, not dead. You keep, you keep the dead. I want him still alive, like he is now. He's breathing, come on, look. <laughs> you leave him for me, okay? You're not worried. I know very well if the centurion shows up and discovers an empty cross, he'll clobber you one by one, a nail here, a nail there, one foot over the other. Boom, boom, boom. I know, I know. But I'm proposing that we don't leave the cross empty. Put somebody up there in his place. Yeah, Judas, for example. Get him down from the fig tree he's hanging from. Come on, go get him. Carry him here. Stick him up with the big four nails. Come on, nobody will notice the switch. Everybody looks the same on the cross, you know? They're all turned to poor Christs. Come on. Is the deal? Done? Go. Okay. No, I'll take care of Christ. No, I'll take care of Christ by myself. Okay, I'll get him down. Okay, I'll use the ladder. Here we go. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> Jesus, pull your arm in a bit, okay? I don't want to crush it. <clears throat> yeah, that's it, like that. Okay, I'm coming. <laughs> Oh, God, Jesus, you know, you never thought it would be a fool who would take you off the cross to save you, did it? <laughs> this is great. 
you save mankind and a fool saves you. <laughs> what a joke. All right, come on. I'm going to pull you off now. No, nah, no, nah, don't worry. I'm going to take you down like a beautiful bride, sweet and precious, carry you on my shoulders, and then I'll take you on a boat that's there on the river all the way to the far shore. And when we get there, oh, how sweet it will be. There's a friend of mine over there. He's a shaman. Okay, he has a lotion, a healing cream. And when he spreads it all over you, okay, you'll be running around like a happy leper. So take it easy, Jesus, okay? Take it easy. What's the matter? Why are you trembling? What, do you have a fever or something? Why are you shaking your head no? You don't want to go. You don't want to be unnailed from here? Why? Could you say that again? I, I didn't understand you. What? For the sacrifice? Because you want to die on the cross? For the sacrifice? To save mankind from their sins, and in exchange for that, you have to die nailed to the cross. Ho, ho! Whoa, whoa, whoa! Come <laughs> What? And you say that I'm the fool? You're the fool, damn it! You and your whole family, starting with God the Father in person and the big bird, the whole lot, of, you're all fools. What a great idea. What a great idea. Divine sacrifice. Oh, boy. Yippee. Do you know what the priests are going to do to you in your holy martyrdom? Hmm? They're going to picture it all in silver to mask your rotting flesh. Huh? They'll turn the drops of your blood into rubies and set it in gold. And the beams of wood of the cross will be bejeweled perfumed and carried around so that all the poor people and peasants will throw themselves down onto their knees before it in mortification, flattened in devotion at the feet of the cross. And the priests that display it in procession will say, look, mm -hmm, look, look what he sacrificed for you. Hmm? Get on your knees and make sacrifices too. On your knees, you slug it. This is how the grand spectacle of your suffering will be used. I mean, some salvation, that is. Come on, arms open like a bird. Your image will be slapped onto shields and implements of war. Your cross will also be painted in vivid colors on banners. Ba -dum, ba -dum, da -dum, da -da -da. It'll be on swords and that slash and kill in the name of God and butcher women and children and men. And There'll be slaughter and massacres in the name of your sign. They'll use your sacrifice to perpetrate huge hoaxes and frauds. What? Say that again? You don't care that they exploit your passion? <laughs> what? It would be enough if one man clear-headed and blessed took your teachings and used it for a holy cause. And who would these worthy men be? Okay, give me some names, okay? Who? Francis? Uh, good. Benedict? Uh-huh. Dominic? Sure. Nicholas, all right, all right. And after they've suffered every imaginable violence and indignity with the goal of comforting and rescuing from desperation the impoverished people who are downtrodden by the wealthy, how did they end up? Skewered alive and spit upon and then kicked around until they dropped dead. Jesus, what did you come on earth to do? Did you come to teach us all that we would all be on a cross from the day we were born? Did you come to teach us all how to live nailed to a cross? No, that's not what we need. Excuse me, don't get angry. I'm sorry, I lost it. But we have no need for this lesson, okay? You should teach us another lesson. Set an example that I've only seen you demonstrate to Christians one time. It was the day you went into church and discovered the noble merchants buying and selling and haggling over merchandise, and you picked up your staff. Picked it up and smack, smack, smack. Christ, that's what you should have taught us. To smack him. Smack him, smack him, smack him. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Thank you so, so very much. And, uh, and yeah, this is, uh, as you can see, it's uh, uh, truly a political theater. I don't know, Bob, can you hear us, can we try and see um, if we can uh, First hear to you? Bob. We're gonna um, uh, get back up. Can you hear us, Bob? There he is, there he is. 
Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, fine. So uh, all I, set? we all said, so I'm sorry about the, uh, the little uh, technical difficulties. No problem, it's only tactical. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not yeah, tactical. That, not tactical. tactical. So um, uh, um, uh, the play we just, uh, the excerpt we saw, but also some of the documentaries, um, it really clearly uh, uh, comes out that Poe is, as you also said, a political a writer, a theater artist, a teatrista, as they would say in Argentina, as we learn today. Um, you have monitored uh, theater, American theater, but also world theater for so many decades, uh, um, over five or six. What, is, what do you think about political theater now? Where is it going? Has it been influenced by Dario Fo? Will, there be, will it come back? I don't think it ever left. It never will leave. It's always necessary to kind of correct the uh, misjudgments and tragedies of humankind. And the best way it can be done is through comic satire. Uh, and that's a form of politics. And uh, Dario was among the best to do that. Uh, not the only one, but among the very best. So uh, it won't leave us as long as we uh, are in an imperfect world, and I, I'm afraid we'll always be in an imperfect world. Yeah, who do you see working now in the tradition of, of a foe, or like reinventing, or like updating you know, this, this, his work? Well, that's a good question. as you might in the movies and, and television. But God knows on TV there are some very brilliant uh, comics and comic commentators. Uh, not exactly like Bo, but you know, someone like Bill Maher, uh, who uh, severs and uh, absolutely eviscerates the stupidities of the time. Um, and um, I'm, I'm, I'm Chris... Uh, what is his name? I'm, I'm blanking with my old 90-year-old memory. Yeah. But, John Stewart. But, or, um, John Stewart unquestionably uh, mm -hmm. was in the poet tradition. Uh, although these were sharp satirists rather than buffoons. And uh, uh, the buffoonery is very hard to come from because it's a very special gift. Mm -hmm. And um, when Dario Fo performed himself, right, in uh, Cambridge when he came, Yes, he and, and the Franca performed, Franca together. performed together. So how was, um, you know, you said it was a success, but how did that really um, come across? He performed in, uh, in his special mixture of uh, uh, his invented languages and uh, in the Italian English. Was it really a, a very clear message that he could send? Or was it a creative uh, misunderstanding? Oh, I don't think anyone missed it. There were subtitles. Uh, we had subtitles above the proscenium, so people knew what he was saying and what Franco was saying. It was uh, around that time that uh, you know Franco got raped um, in that really infamous uh, event, uh, which he was taken by a bunch of uh, fascists into a van and raped, and uh, she was never quite the same as a result. Yeah, it was. That's a, <clears throat> it is, uh, is that job. Yeah, it is uh, another uh, another um, uh, uh, incident of state violence against theater artists and or against the people um, from from the left. Um, I think uh, perhaps we uh, we go on now to uh, to the next play and. Um, and uh, the excerpt, or you know, of the um, accidental um, tourist. And I don't know if you can. Can you hear there when Joe performs? Can you see him? And uh, yes, wonderful. So maybe there we go. He's got uh, notes for me. Would to the please? next one. And yeah, Bob, he wants you to get. <laughs> he wants you to give him some notes uh, right after this. Uh, how he can improve. Well, I, always, I always give my notes to Joe. Yes. <laughs> how we, how he can uh, improve he this. Take, he never takes the notes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, so right um, maybe we switch back um, to the black screen. And um, mm. in this play, uh, Joe asked me to say, this is all about Black Lives Matters. And it's about well, uh, uh, police shootings. Connecting it to, uh, yeah. OK. Oh, mess up my pages. Accidental Death of an Anarchist. 
an ordinary office in the central police headquarters in Milan, a drab and bureaucratic room dominated by a very large window. <clears throat> 39 cents. Good evening. I am Inspector Francesco Giovanni Battista Giancarlo Bertozzo of the Security Police. This is my office on the first floor of our notorious headquarters in Milan. Notorious following a sordid little incident a few weeks ago when an anarchist under interrogation in a room similar a few floors above accidentally fell through the window. Although my colleagues claim quite reasonably that the incident was a suicide. The official verdict of the inquiry is that the death of the anarchist was uh, accidental. <laughs> a bit ambiguous, you see, uh, so there's been some public outrage, accusations, demonstrations, and so on flying around this building for weeks. Not the best atmosphere uh, in which a decent nine to five plainclothes policeman like myself can do an honest, inconspicuous day's work. <laughs> well, you know, I get all types in here. Hippies, junkies, pimps, arsonists, millennials. It's a sort of a clearinghouse, you might say. Oh, excuse me. Next! <clears throat> I ought to warn you all that the author of this sick little play, Dario Fo, has the traditional irrational hatred of the police common to all narrow-minded left-wingers. And so I shall, no doubt, be the unwilling butt of endless anti-authoritarian jibes. So please bear with me, thank you. <clears throat> yeah, so uh, let's see. This isn't the first time you've been up here for impersonation, is it? In all, you've been arrested, let me see. Twice as a surgeon, three times as a bishop, army captain, tennis umpire. <clears throat> 11 arrests altogether. But I'd like to point out that I have never actually been convicted, inspector. I don't know how the hell You've been getting away with it, but this time, we'll have you. That's a promise. Oh, mouth-watering, isn't it? <laughs> a nice clean record like mine, just begging to be defiled. <laughs> the char anyway, the charges state that you falsely assumed the identity of a professor of psychiatry and former don of the University of Padua. That's fraud. Fraud? <laughs> when con convicted or committed by a sane man, yes. But I'm a lunatic, a certified psychotic. That proves it. I make sounds like nobody else. Okay. Well, look, at me here, read my medical report. I mean, committed 16 times, the same thing every time. Histrionic mania from the Latin histriones, to act the part of. My hobby, you see, is the theater, and my theater is the theater of reality, so my fellow artists must be real people, unaware that they are acting in my productions, which is handy, as you see. I've got no cash to pay them. <clears throat> exactly. You swindle them. I've never swindled anyone. I applied for a grant from the Ministry of Culture, but I hadn't got the right connections. <laughs> uh, according to my notes, <clears throat> as this psychiatrist, you were charging your clients 200,000 lira a visit well, a reasonable fee for a man with my qualifications. What qualification? 20 years of intensive training in 16 different loony bins under some of the best shrinks in the biz. Unlike your run-of-the-mill man, I immerse myself in my studies. Okay, slept with them as well when the beds ran out. Had slept head to toe in the cots. Make your own inquiries. I'm a bloody genius. Yes, a genius with a superb fee, too. Huh? The fee is indispensable. It's an indispensable part of the treatment. I, if I didn't relieve those twits of the odd 200,000, I'd lose all credibility, right? I mean, any less they'd think I was no good, a beginner or something. I mean, even Freud, <laughs> ah, Sigmund. Even Freud said a fat bill is the most effective panacea, especially for the doctor. <laughs> this is your visiting card, is it not? It is. <clears throat> Professor Antonio Rabia, psychiatrist formerly lecturer at the University of Padua. Are you Antonio Rabia? Not exactly. But what's that mean? I'm a professor. Oh, you are, huh? Yes, of design, decoration, and freehand drawing at the College of the Sacred Redeemer. I take evening classes. It says here, psychiatrist. After the comma? Yes. Before the full stop? Yes. 
Exactly. Exactly what? Professor Antonio Rava, comma, capital P, psychiatrist, full stop. I take it you're familiar with the rules of syntax and punctuation. Where's the fraud? Formerly lecturer at the University of Padua. True or false? After the formerly? What? Another comma. Can't you even read? I hadn't noticed it. Oh, you don't notice these things. Innocent people like me are thrown behind bars. You are mad. I know. What have these commas got to do with it? Nothing to someone with your rudimentary education, evidently. Look, the punctuation changes the whole emphasis of the sentence, OK? After the comma, the reader, your good self, takes a short mental breath, thus changing the intentionality. You see? So the sentence should read, Professor Antonio Raba, comma, capital P, psychiatrist, full stop, OK? Formally, comma, lecturer at the University of Padua, you see? Read correctly, only an asshole would swallow it. I'm an asshole then, am I? No, 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 no. Your grammar's a bit retarded, that's all. I could give you a refresher course, cut rate naturally. Let's begin by repeating all the subjective, subjective, objective, and Italian pronouns, thus beginning with io sono, tu sei, loro sono, le. Come, come on, are you going to do this with me or not? No, come on, don't be shy. Oh, io sono, may we, that's French, may we get on with this fucking statement? Fine. I'll type, qualified secretary, 45 words per minute. Shut up! Or shorthand, Where's the, where do you keep the carbons around here? Look, get the cuffs on him. No, 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 a straight jacket or nothing for me. Article 122 of the Penal Code, whoever in his capacity as a public official imposes non-clinical instruments of restraint upon a psychologically disturbed person in a manner liable to provoke a crisis in the disturbance shall incur charges punishable by 5 to 15 years with the person of the place. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Joe. Maybe just join us also for a moment. Oh, sure. And, um, and, uh, and uh, the, the, the play, of course, goes on in the police station that uh, the imposter pretends to be a judge. And, um, and he then uh, uh, investigates uh, the case, which, of course, was not an accidental death. He was killed by the police. And it turned out that the bombs he was accused of having uh, uh, put into the bank or, and in other places were actually post, put there by the police uh, uh, in the very first place. Actually, a real case, Dayofo uh, performed it for two years during the, uh, the case uh, actually developed. Um, and they so did like updates every evening. And he said he had to fight about 40 lawsuits. And um, it became a very, very, uh, very famous play. Maybe next to We Won't Pay or I Won't Pay, the most uh, uh, successful one. Um, Bob, if it's okay, maybe we ask Joe. You were in the Broadway production, right? Of right of this. Tell us a little bit. How did that happen? And um, who asked you? And how did it go? Well, um, first I had done a play by Dario three years earlier. Um, uh, it was it was I think it was right after your Bob, right after your departure. We did a play called About Face at the Yale Rep, uh, and Andre directed it, Belgrader, and. Uh, Dario was not allowed in the country at the time. I mean, everybody was trying because he was on a terrorist list, of course, and they couldn't get anywhere near the country. So a few years later, they had done this production down at the arena in DC, uh, and it was translated by Richard Nelson, the playwright. And um, they brought it, brought it to Broadway, and Alexander Cohen, the, uh, the old Broadway, uh, well, director, uh, producer, um, wanted to put it on Broadway. So he, uh, by that time, things were loosening up. And I know he really, uh, among others, and it might have been you too, Bob, but he went to bat with a lot of people to get this silly terrorist list thing taken away. So we, we were rehearsing at the Belasco Theater, and it was myself and Jonathan Price and Patty Lapone and Bill Irwin and Ray Serra. And uh, Alex walks in the back of the theater in the middle of rehearsal, and he brings in Dario and Franca. <laughs> they were, they had been sprung so to speak, sprung to America, which for them would have been the opposite of being sprung, right? And, uh, and it was great. The, the funny thing was, because they didn't speak any English, this, this is probably about 81, they didn't speak any English, but we did a couple of scenes for them, and, and Dario irrepressibly jumped up on the stage and speaking Italian a mile a minute, saying to Jonathan about, you would do this by doing like that, and then when you get to this moment, you do that. So he was giving a whole lesson. But um, they were, we talked very, they talked very seriously a little bit about 
the initiative they had going in Italy, which was to get a lot of political people out of prison, and they were raising money to raise bail for these people. So uh, that night, I, I just as a side note, that night I said, oh, I'd love to give you something, you know. So that night I went to the, Alex had put them in the Plaza Hotel, which was so incongruous. <laughs> and uh, I went to the Plaza Hotel with my, <laughs> with my meager $50 check, you know, and uh, Franca received me, and it was so funny, she came walking, I was a suite, and uh, just the idea that they were in this plaza suite. Uh, but she always looked glamorous, so she was, you know, she had, she was a dish. Um, anyway, but that was, that was kind of my experience with the whole thing. And then but Joe, you, re you, you remember that, that he came to America in 2001 to oversee a uh, play we were doing, uh, the one you were in, the John Fordan Fordan play. No, I wasn't in it. Though. No, it wasn't me. Oh, you weren't in that. No. Right. No. But he, he came there. He, he we, we we worked through um, uh, some congressman. I forgot his name. Uh, and it managed to uh, open the doors for him. Well, he had, I'm talking about 20 years earlier. Oh, 20 years earlier? Yeah, 1981. Yeah. Oh, 86, did you just look it up? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. The, but the, the, talk a bit about oh. the, I think this is the 86 production of the accidental Yeah, I'm death. sorry. Yeah, I'm so not. how did that happen? Oh, yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. Who, how did that happen? Who asked you and uh, how well, did it go? Uh, you know, I, I don't know. I think, uh, I forgot if they asked me or if I had to go read for somebody, but I knew everybody in the play, and I knew the people who were producing it, so I don't know. I probably went in and read, and, and, uh, and that was it. But I was excited, because, uh, and then when I found out he was coming over, it was like, because we did the other play, and it was, uh, I don't know if you know the, the other play, About Face, but that's an incredible play. Uh, it's uh, about a guy who, uh, he gets transformed into the face of Johnny Agnelli, who was the president of Fiat, the owner of Fiat, you know? And it was all about hiding out and this guy being mistaken and his wife getting all confused. And it had a lot of resonance because it wasn't long after, I believe it was right after the Aldo Moro uh, incident, which the Prime Minister of Italy was, was uh, kidnapped and subsequently murdered because they wouldn't negotiate. And of course, in years later, it was very upsetting because a lot of people felt that the government didn't negotiate because they weren't happy that Aldo Moro was willing to speak to the left as a coalition. And so it's like, wow, we're not gonna negotiate. Mm -hmm. And they took care of them for him, I think. So were there any kind of, um, how would one say, edits or censorship or whatever to the play? Do you remember the for? No, I mean, th that's who, the how thing. How did that go? Yeah, I don't think there was any, I mean, uh, as I said, it was Richard Nelson's translation. I, that was a one-off. Uh, he, he did it and uh, it's, it's not even done it. Before that, it was done a lot in London. It was very popular because you know, if you look at the, the translations that are around, they, even this one, these things say words like bloke, you know, and arsehole, you know, which we don't use. Uh, well, we can. It's very colorful, actually. I would like to use that mm. word more often. And how was how successful was it? The run? not successful. Uh, I remember going to the restaurant, and uh, I was a little late, and I walked in, and it was as if somebody had let out the biggest fart ever in the world, because the Times had just arrived. And those were the days when the New York Times arrived after a show, and you knew whether you would go to work tomorrow or not. You know. So how long was the run at the end? Three or four weeks, maybe, yeah. Hmm? Oh, that's a good one. I want, it might have been like, uh, I don't think it was Eater. It was, some, it was a guy after him. It might have been. Was it Kerr? Bob. No, it was before that, Bob. It would have been whoever succeeded. Uh, yeah, it might have been, it might have been yeah. Rich. Yeah, he was starting out in those days. Mm -hmm. Barnes are rich. So uh, a question for both of you. We don't want to talk about critics. No. Slay them. Slay <laughs> them. <laughs> Drive them out, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, a question for Bob and also for Joe. Uh, would, it, would a Dario full play work now? Is that in that climate now with Trump and, and everything? Would that? Bob? You're asking if his work is uh, relevant today? Yeah, would it if work? Would it work? Would it work? Would, it work? Okay, would people connect? Is it, would it be the same as 10 years ago, or do you think something changed? No, I think his work is always appropriate and relevant. Uh, I don't think uh, it would change in any other climate other than the fascist or fascist of some kind, where you couldn't put it on. But he's, uh, he's always relevant. You know, the
the thing I like about Mistero Bufo and having watched him do it as, as a solo, the thing that's wonderful about it is he's, when he gets to that point when he's talking, you know, and he's down there, he's just nailed into the cross. It's his job, you know, that's his rice bowl, the guy. But he has to then go to him, and he's very deferential. He's as, he's as deferential as any, uh, any peasant in front of Christ would have been. Jesus, you know what I'm saying? Jesus, you know, uh, we don't want to bother you, you know? But uh, he is made flesh so I can talk to him. But the thing is, he sort of, Dario is very canny. He infers that you have to have all the respect that everybody has to have in order to talk to people. So if you're talking to people who are, say, uh, in this country who are uh, of, a, of a very strong uh, religious or fundamentalist uh, beat, you know what I mean? He's going to talk to you that way, you know? And I think what Bob said earlier is extraordinarily important. He said the, the writing and the writers exist and, and, and all that, but the bufo, the ability to entertain with it, doesn't necessarily exist in abundance right now. And I, I know I teach millennials, and they're so friggin' serious, I want to shake them and you know, kiss them and smack them uh, because they got to just, something's got to happen. But the point is, it's very hard to do. And as I learned reading Brecht, because Bob was the greatest proponent of Brecht and Kurt Weill of anybody at one point in mm -hmm. American theater history. Um, I, should, I should add that he was, he was not perfect, though. And he did have a strong anti-Zionist uh, quality in him, which led him to say uh, that, uh, to, to imply that what he called mad Zionists might have been responsible for the... Uh, the uh, 2001 bombings, uh, 2000, yeah, and uh, I think, I don't know if he'd hold that position today, but he did then, and uh, it was unfortunate. Yeah, I, I, there seems to be something that wants to hold that position almost everywhere. You know what I mean? I don't know why. But there seems to be something that wants to hold that position in corners that you least expect it. I mean, mm. I, I think his the, the 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 quote why he got most into trouble, if I remember right, it was Susan Sontag, but also him. I think he gave an interview to a Rye uh, uh, radio reporter, and after the official interview was over, but the reporter did let uh, the spool run. He did say, "Well, America perhaps got what it deserved. What do you expect? You know, after so many years of, uh, in his view, imperialistic colonial." Um, 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 acting around the world, of course, somewhere, somewhere will come and try to dis to destroy you. And um, um, and as an artist's uh, uh, opinion, that should be respected as uh, everything else. And nobody is always it's right, always as no one is always wrong. And I think when will it was we ever stop dealing and discovering that anti-Semitism was was uh, you know latent or evident in our, I mean Ezra Pound and you know of course Wagner and all the others. It's, a, it's just there. It's, yeah. it's almost like a club. Yeah. No, but maybe let's open up. Let's put up the, uh, uh, um, the uh, uh, lights. Right. Let me, the let me, make, let me yeah. just make one point. But I wanted to finish what I was saying, Bob. Uh, Bob, the Brechtian thing, which I think was so important that I think is, is essential to Foe, which it will, if it ever becomes re revived, it'll be great. But Brecht always said, you must teach and entertain, but in the same measure. And people don't get it, you know what I mean? They, they try, it's very hard to do. So to really entertain, you literally need to be watching something and go, this is, this is make, I'm enjoying this, but how could I enjoy it? They just said that, or it's talking about this, but then I'm enjoying it. And Brecht's basically saying, that's the glue, that's the salve that allows it to go into your system. That's the, that's the thing that allows it to enter you intravenously. And when it happens, You've learned something, but you haven't had a problem learning it. You know what I mean? You can think about it. And that's all. I just wanted to get that off my chest for some stupid reason. Yeah. Let, me add, let me add a personal note, because he was also an extremely hospitable human being. And he invited my wife, Doreen, and I to his uh, home in Fort Lee, uh, which is a lovely uh, place in Tuscany on a, on a pond. Uh, and he was extremely sweet to us. And I remember him uh, both personally and professionally with extraordinary affection mm -hmm. and uh, respect. Yeah. Well, one could argue about Brecht that perhaps after the Three Penny Opera, even Brecht himself was struggling, you know, to really uh, do a successful uh, 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 theater which is pleases the audience but also the critics and everybody agreed on because his plays became so very 
didactic also. A great example is Bob produced Happy End, a brilliant version of Happy End, which was the play that immediately followed Three Penny Opera, uh, around the success of it. Happy End opened, if I got the story wrong, Bob, you correct me, but I know Michael Feingold will. Um, uh, the play opens in, in Berlin to great acclaim, except uh, uh, Helena Weigel rewrites the last speech. So instead of it carrying through that the, the criticism that's inherent in the story about the, the meld of corruption and crime and the need for crime among poor people and yet the religious aspect, all of it, it's wonderfully bundled. She comes on and makes a very pointed speech uh, against uh, businessmen and capitalists and people like that. And the play closed like that because it was too, it was too strident, you see? And that's the, that's the way I remember. And this is what, this is the, this is where you walk. This is why just now we heard a line about Dario Fo's anti-Zionist, anti let's say. I want to be correct on that. But you know, it's like, huh. You know, in, some in all of our minds, people fall off the straight and narrow. Of course, the problem is we create a point on that straight and narrow that's sharper and sharper, and we pedestalize them, and, and they're just schmucks like us. Mm -hmm. well, we all make mistakes, and we all, we all have errors, but uh, um, that is true what you said about Helena Weigel's uh, uh, final speech, and it's, uh, it's no longer in the play. Mm -hmm. It was her improvisation, actually. Uh, so the play does survive, even though we had the same trouble with it. You know, it didn't, it didn't, uh, it didn't last very long. Yeah. I mean, it, it lasted, but it didn't get very good response from the critics. And you know, he didn't actually write uh, the play. His mistress, or yeah. the Schwartzman, yeah. Yeah. wrote Hauptmann. the play itself. He wrote the lyrics, Hauptmann, yeah. which are brilliant. Mm. It's best, some of the best music he ever wrote, including Survival and Johnny um, and, and others. And the Bill Bowler song. Yeah. yeah. The Bilbao song, too, yes. Mm -hmm. Anyway, we're, we're not talking. But as well, um, we moved to Germany in honor yeah, of you, Frank. No. Now we must go back to Italia. Uh, hey, hey! Let's open up Viva the and, and maybe some comments or some questions. We have a microphone because we also record it and uh, we uh, also live stream it. So we have uh, Jim first and then you. Um, I've seen, a, oh, I don't know, probably six, seven different productions of, uh, of Foe's plays. and. Uh, and, you know, very interesting one that was at ACT a number of years ago of the Pope and the Witch. And my overall experience is while there was something that was very interesting, very stimulating about them, I always felt that I was watching a musical composition that was maybe written in A minor but was being played in C major, <laughs> that something was preventing them from genuinely becoming a totality and really serving as you know, a spontaneous comic whole. Um, having done the stuff that you've done, Joe, what would be, if I came to you as a young actor and said, give me one thing to hold on to, to perform Dario Fo? Well, I totally agree with you. And I think the Brits had success with Fo for a while, but they kept putting it in the British idiom. And the more they did, the more it got away from that sort of uh, inherent slapdash, personality-driven need in, in Foe's plays and the way Foe performs them, there's almost a need for him to entertain himself. You see? <coughs> and when it gets put out in formal theater, the way you know, even great English-speaking theater does, it, it, it's, it gets kind of scrubbed. It gets kind of lost. That happened to our production of, 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 uh, on Broadway, and I, I never could figure out, you know, I knew, I knew there's something wrong. In fact, when Frank sent me to look at this material, I hadn't looked at the footage of Foe on YouTube and stuff, and I went, Son of a bitch, that's how it does. That's how it works, you know what I mean? If it's going to work. And you can't force the Italian idiom on uh, the Italian comedy a paradigm on Americans uh, any more than you can force the British music hall paradigm on us. Vaudeville works better for us, music hall works better for them. Mm -hmm. And there is that, and, I, and I'm sorry to say, people may try to force a square peg into a round hole forever and ever, but you've got to figure out a way to mm -hmm. do that. I know in Germany um, there was the faux reception was also divided by states whether they were Catholic or Protestant. In Catholic states, you know, it worked extremely well and people laughed and uh, in Protestant uh, things like Hessian or others, people say, yeah, it's interesting, but they didn't collect uh, on such a deep uh, level because also that kind of um, play of faux with God, religion and Catholic thinking and the suffering yeah. of the ridiculous novice was not a mess strongly there, but um, we're going to give the mic to you. 
I just wanted to say that uh, although the accidental death uh, only ran, you said, for three or four weeks, I, so. I saw it back then in 86, oh, thanks probably to TDF. Yes. And I remembered the name, Dario so that when I saw it in your literature here that you were going to be devoting the day to it, oh. I remembered from all these years, I'd never had any exposure to him until I saw him on the screen uh, this evening, that uh, it did last all those years. Uh, yeah, so there was something, yeah. Well, you, you, you know, the, 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 the ironies and the, the episodes in the play, that's, you know, that's, they, kind of stick with you. Yeah, they're pretty, you know, pretty miserable. <laughs> Another question um, over here. Uh, on the topic of contemporary relevance, I just wanted to say that the episodes that we saw in the films today involving Boniface the Eighth, the narcissistic congenital liar whom Dante condemned to hell during his own lifetime, certainly resonated with our imperfect president. <laughs> yeah, and also, Bob, you could say something about Dario's, Dario's narcissism, too. It's really, it's, it's part and parcel of what he does in front of us, don't you think? Dario's own narcissism? Yeah, I, I, I find it really, you know, it's, it's almost as if he's almost trying to remain relevant beyond his own narcissism. And it's a cat fight, you know? <laughs> sometimes he loses, sometimes he wins. Uh, so we sometimes he wins, sometimes we win. But uh, um, I, I don't know, you know, it's funny when you talk about uh, the president or whoever, but I always thought uh, Foa always, um, he took a strangely, uh, like the, the way he depicted Agnelli, the president of Fiat, who was vilified as, as a, pretty bad man by a lot of people, certainly the left. And some of the other people uh, he talks about, he throws them a sympathetic bone in a way. He actually forces you to sort of like have to, you know, I, I would love to see what he would do about, uh, about this guy right now. Yeah. It would be wonderful. He would say, no, he'd probably make him, probably make him a kind of a befuddled victim in a way, you know. And, but he never erased the fact, as he does in some of those speeches, that, Jesus, do you realize how many people have died and been quartered, you know, in the name, uh, you know, in, in Hawkest, you know? I think in one of his la latest last plays, he wrote, uh, I think George Bush and Putin had kind of some kind of a train, brain transplant or something. And yeah. uh, it was kind of a farcical um, political um, 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 comedy. But yeah, now, most probably, that's a good observation that he would put him up as a new pope, right? I don't know. Trump, the, yeah. This Comedia thing has always been diabolical. When I was studying with, at, at Yale when Bob was there, I was so interested. I bought a book, and I wanted to find out. And, he, and everybody was trying to do it. And I said, I want to say forget about it. I just want to say forget about it. You know, I don't know why. It, it's always sort of something you want to refer to, and you think it's going to be magical. And then you do one of the plays, and you find yourself stuck in a corner that isn't as relevant. Uh, as, as it you should know, it's be. Like, it's like people trying to imitate Charles Chaplin. Yeah. Actually, uh, Tommy Derrick does a terrific job. I still go to his imitation. And uh, there's something about thinking about Chaplin that can't be about any of his imitators. The same thing is true of, uh, of uh, Dario Pro. Yeah, although I do say, though, uh, I do think that having looked over this material again, there is, there. I think the answer is in uh, some of the monologues, but the Mysterio Buffo completely produced when he was with his company. Oh my God, the, comp the, the, the just the, the choreography and all the things that give you great delight in watching. You know, uh, throwing it's it's a lot of fun to watch. It's more fun than just listening to the words. And I wish everybody could have that experience. I was just going to say that um, I I wonder if maybe an issue might be the relationship that American audiences have with clowns, there's a certain fear of clowns, <laughs> and, and, and as opposed especially to New York, they're adorable. And I, I noticed, just especially watching the material earlier, that he brings the audience in in a way that we don't really know how to do. Like, he, he mm -hmm. gets them in. He's not terrorizing them. He's saying, you're with me. We're going to do this together. 
and maybe that approach made it work for him in a way that we don't inherit, you know, naturally understand as American performers. Yeah, certainly he, in a way, he's a stand-up comedian, right? He just has a mic, goes up in front of people. I liked in the videos because the people are right and left to him and in front, you know, almost like in a circus uh, uh, set and in a stage. And, um, and well, again, I think our forms are our forms are further away from that. I mean, uh, physical stand-up comedy is much closer to that in this country, if you want to make it out, but nobody's looking at that right now. They want it to be theater, and, and theater gives it a certain validity and patina and probably gets better grants, you know? You can teach it, you can teach theater in academia that way, you know? So, I, you know, otherwise mm -hmm. it would be. I mean, Lenny Bruce was very animated when he did this stuff. He did a lot of voices, he did a lot of characters, you know? Uh, uh, and you get the feeling from Dario that uh, having, I love it when he's bringing people and he's going, oh, you're late, sit over here, you know? I'll come out, okay, beep, 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 you know, go over there, you say, oh, go. No, that's okay. Oh, you want to walk across? Walk across, come on. Okay, well, what are you going to do? What did you, did you, did you eat late? You know, something like that, you know? I get the feeling that uh, he needs that, you know? But um, I don't know, we don't, we've sort of, parted ways a little bit between the forms. We segregate the forms a little bit. Uh, and I don't know if we like it. I, I think just like we're a little bit shy about sex, generally, we're a little, you know, we're shy about that too, you know. Mm -hmm. so exchanging bodily fluids. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I'm getting obscene here, Bob. Um, no, I just wanted to add something about the use of language in Dario Fo because you, you mentioned a lot about the contents, about themes, topics that... Oh my God, I thought it was him talking. <laughs> no, 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 it's me. I thought he was throwing his voice. <laughs> Ventriloquismo. <laughs> Sorry. Um, the use of language in Dario Fo, you mentioned the grammar a lot, and so he, he uses this uh, language that it is not a language as a kind of an instrument to tell story, but rather the opposite, upside down. It's a very postmodern concept, this way of deconstruct the language to tell a story, but at the same time, the language is built without having a language before the story. So it's like a circular relationship between t telling story and, uh, and having a means to, to communicate and that was very innovative and very postmodern at the time, but at the same time rooted in a tradition. If you, if you think about how illiterate people in the Middle Age, I don't know, well, that's used, to, a, used to learn you know, a language. That might be a way of empowering yes, more literate exactly. people. Yes, exactly. Because it was very they don't have democratic. to feel responsible for all the intellectuals who are standing behind them going, oh, this, you know these illusions, right? You know what I'm talking about, right? No, it's like it makes everybody as everybody equally stupid and smart. And I think it's kind of an interesting leveling of the, of the perceptual field to give an advantage. I don't know what you would think, but. Yeah, exactly. That it's, it was like an happening. A happening is the telling story in around the fire, I don't know, in the Middle Age or in, uh, in, uh, in um, ancient societies. Wow. And in that way, the, the culture of the community grows around the common language that it developed in, in this happening. Right. So yeah. it's, it's yeah. opposite as how modern theater worked yeah. until this. Certainly, he, he, he played uh, with language and didn't trust language. It's the decentralization in a way of the central text as you know, it's now Hans Ties Lehmann and so many others put on. But maybe a question to Valeria who also is a producer. Is Dario Fo performed in Italy at the moment? What's his legacy in Italy? In Italy, is a god, you know? <laughs> because he, he died uh, last year after a very big production in uh, his life. Uh, everybody knows uh, the work of Dario Fo in Italy. And um, I, I, I have a lot of, uh, uh, of thoughts about uh, Dario Fo works also because I, I, I was, uh, um, the, my teacher was the brother or uh, of Dario, oh, yeah. Fulvio. Jacopo, oh. Ful no, Jacopo is, uh, is the son. Oh, the son, yeah. Uh, the oh. brother was uh, Fulvio, that was bigger, uh, uh, oldest than uh, Dario. 
And I, I have a lot of uh, um, some accounts. Stories. About stories uh, about uh, uh, his uh, juvenile life. Uh, there is a very, very funny to remember. Oh, really? Uh, and uh, and uh, of also knowing that you know why he produced uh, such a lot of uh, innovative and uh, uh, visionary theater as he did because uh, he grew up uh, during the war, and uh, he, his uh, heart uh, grew up during the war. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was a, a very funny, funny guy with uh, all the crew of uh, friends uh, and uh, other people that uh, uh, challenged in uh, heart what uh, was going on around as uh, the war period, mm -hmm. World War II. So I, I, I am very interested in uh, all the, the things that happen today because uh, it's uh, strange for me mm -hmm. uh, to, <laughs> uh, to know about Dario Fo here in the uh, US because uh. it was interdicted, as you told, you know? so it was a terrorist here. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, now I, I know what uh, happened in the other side of the ocean, but I, I didn't know <laughs> now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so yeah. it's very interesting to do yeah. to know that. I think right now he'd have thank you a thank tough you. time deciding which government to make fun of, the Italian or the American, because they're both going like, <laughs> boop, boop, you know, they're <laughs> pazzo. Well, so there is a, in both ways. Yeah, in, in their own ways, it would be too much. He would have a short circuit. I got the distinct impression, just on a on a person to person level, that that uh, Franca just meeting her was the more. She was a little more serious about the uh, about the present politics of the day, you know. It was a little more, but I I, I don't know. I mean, unless he was just, she seemed uh, like she really was uh, determined mm -hmm. to do to uh, to raise money to help a lot of these people, especially that were being thrown in jails and stuff like that. But um, but you know, Valeria, you can. I, 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 you can say the the whole idea that always kind of baffles me is you know how fashionable the Communist Party was in the 60s and 70s. It's a whole different feeling. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, it had a whole different vibe. You know, it wasn't like the uh, you know the the, the 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 there was a sort of a yeah, a I trendiness to it. Hope, yeah. It was interesting too to understand it was the start on the avant spectacle in Italy. Mm. The avant spectacle is a, a form of theater that was born uh, just to fight against uh, the boring uh, period of the <laughs> war. So uh, it, it's interesting how the avant spectacle changed in the innovative uh, theater in the 60s and the 70s, and then in the 80s, uh, and then uh, bye bye, because bye -bye, uh, yeah. now <laughs> we are <laughs> in the medieval. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> it's a. Uh, well, we are working to to go out, you know, mm -hmm. Frank. You know. Yeah, and then I, I, for sure, it's a very fragile theater, as Bob said. You know, it doesn't travel so well. It's complicated. I, I think he grew up with glass blowers in his little town. He always said he admired them. So, and glass is. Where did he grow up again? I think Which he was in northern Italy, in right? Sorry? He, he grew up in northern Italy, uh, Dario. Yeah, Luino. 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 Yeah. Al nord is in the north. Oh, okay. 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 Yeah. And but what I admired, I saw him perform also in tents in Italy. Um, he was a, such an authentic performer. He owned his theater. He was not working for somebody. He was not hired. He did not do it just for. He loved it. He enjoyed it also. He, and he set energy free. And uh, and he did it with nothing really. In that kind of idea of a poor theater, in that not in the Kortowski sense, but he really, really had just a microphone and he created universes um, on stage and really was, I think, on the right side of justice and, and uh, of politics and, uh, and of the arts. And, and fun. And uh, really, really <laughs> That's funny what I think and made people laugh lot. and I think this is something that is important. That we all ham. Have, to, have to remember that in that, you know, there is a, uh, 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 to have a smile and also to communicate what, what we want to do in theater that uh, it's, a, it's a big lesson at least from from his side. I mean, the only people compared to him as a couple would be most probably uh, Judith Molina and, and Julian Back, you know, would be the American counterpart of a uh, Frank Aram and a uh, Dario Fo. But they weren't funny. They weren't, well, uh, I think they were funny, but not they always. They were, but in not that like that. I mean, right, Bob? Yeah. I mean, not funny. No, they weren't funny. <laughs> you remember he invited them to the Yale Repertory Theater his first year and he had to go bail them out of jail. 
<laughs> no, I think uh, she was, uh, Judith was, I think, had a great sense of humor, but maybe not always oh, yeah, in the, no, in the work. Well, oh, Heiner Müller, if you look at. Deadly yeah, Deadly Serious. Yeah, Deadly Serious. Yeah, it was serious. Or if you look at the work of uh, Heiner Müller or uh, Pasolini, in a way, it was, you know, much more a, a serious um, approach as. Um, they, they went out to the streets in their underwear. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and caused a riot in the streets of New Haven. Yeah. <laughs> they all got arrested. Yeah. <clears throat> So, um, <laughs> but it's a, it is a remarkable that they, as a, as a couple, you know, really wrote um, like theater history. Yeah. 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 To get arrested in your underwear. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's, yeah. So, can, uh, I say two things? can I say two things about yes. that? Yes. Uh, one is that I'm really extremely impressed by his knowledge of Dario. And two, that Joe uh, probably did the best. Uh, Disney in the history of uh, productions of Midsummer Night's Dream, yeah. two times, both at Yale and at the American Repertory Theater. He was hilarious, and I'll never forget that performance. So thank you for that, Joe, wow. 30 years later. <laughs> you didn't see it. This was well, let me do it for you. OK, it starts out. Midsummer Night's Dream. Well, there's this flute guy. Yeah. He's the main character. Mm -hmm. No, it was a fortunate. Bob, we put together yeah. an, an ensemble. It was, I'll never forget, because Alvin Epstein was directing, and Alvin was always so busy looking at designs and dealing with his poodles in rehearsal uh, <laughs> that he didn't mind that me and Chuck and Jerry Dempsey and whoever else was Fred Moore, we, were, we would say, Bob, we're going to work on this scene. We really created those scenes ensemble, you know? And, and it was, uh, you, couldn't, you couldn't go for those laughs that we got without everybody being in on it and being happy with it. So. But, but the good thing is you got a note from Bob even 30 years later uh, on your performance. I got a note. And uh, so, um, Bob so paid me the don't way. forgive him, forget to give him notes of tonight. I think we are close um, uh, to time now and um, we would like to thank uh, Joe, of course, you know, for coming, preparing for Bob, who's like uh, in the Star Trek movies, the Admiral, who is be <laughs> who is beamed in on the uh, uh, on the screen. Yes, yes. So Admiral uh, 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 Bob, thank you so much for uh, joining us tonight, and um, and uh, let's all you know really send a farewell to Dario for one of the greats um, of the theater. And uh, I, as far as we know, it's the only evening in both Americas honoring him, and he really deserves that. So thank you all for coming. And thank you, Bob and Joe. Thank you. Good talk.